On today's program, College Board President George Hanford talks about scholastic aptitude testing and new research projects in five major American cities to develop appropriate curriculum. The Muncie Symphony Graduate String Quintet performs a Mozart selection, and Dr. Wayman Spence, noted health authority, talks about wellness. George Hanford, College Board President, talked to a Ball State audience about assessment in the pursuit of excellence. He shared those and other views with us. Dr. Hanford, the College Board is, is known for its strong research arm. Let, let's talk about some of the research that is currently being conducted. Uh, I understand that you have a project going on in five major American cities. Well, we have uh, that one in particular. Uh, this is a uh, with our Equality Project that's spelled with a capital E and a capital Q, uh, where we've been trying uh, throughout the country to uh, develop a curriculum, uh, an outline of a curriculum that all students going on to college ought to have. Uh, one of the facets of that work is uh, we call reasoning. Youngsters ought not just to be able to read and write and speak and listen and do math, but they ought to be able to think about it and reason. And uh, we do have, uh, have had for a couple of years now a project in uh, five cities uh, throughout the country uh, where they've been attempting to see if youngsters can't have their reasoning abilities more fully developed in conjunction with English courses and math courses. Is this because uh, the stat tests have come under criticism from minorities because the cities that you've chosen, such as San Antonio and Detroit, have large black and Hispanic populations? Well, I think uh, those children in inner cities are the ones who are least well served by our educational uh, system today. And so we've chosen to go into circumstances where uh, the most help seems to be needed to see if we can uh, uh, make some progress. We think we think we are. Uh, these these youngsters, uh, uh, when they have the opportunity, can do an awful lot better in school than they're doing now. Do you think that the, the stat tests are uh, sided towards uh, um, well, what, the majority? <laughs> well, let me put it this way: the the, the test, uh, the scholastic aptitude test itself, is designed to predict how well young people will do in college. That's its job. And uh, actually, it predicts equally well for majority students and minority students alike. The fact remains, however, that on the average across the country, youngsters from uh, minority backgrounds tend to do less well on the test uh, than the majority. But that more a measure of the deficit that we have to make up, the educational deficit that the country has to make up, uh, than of uh, anything being wrong with the youngsters themselves. Uh, so that we, we contend the tests are not racially biased. That's, that's the charge that's frequently made. They aren't. They do as well for blacks as for whites, for instance. But it's just that the whites don't have the same, uh, have better, more effective educational opportunities than black youngsters, on the average. Mm -hmm. I always have to say on the average, because uh, there are lots of, uh, uh, white youngsters who don't do so well on the test and an awful lot of black youngsters who do real well. So we always just have to say on the average. And that's the reason for your research in these major cities. Yeah, to see if what we can do to help young people uh, in inner city schools uh, try to get their educational service, if you will, to them uh, up to where it is for the others. Criticism has been aimed at the current administration for their uh, lack of funding and educational projects, cutting of some funds, and so forth. Do you think education has suffered at the expense of the administration? Oh, I think uh, it has some, but I don't think education has suffered uh, as heavily as the administration <laughs> would have liked it to. Why uh, would the administration like it to suffer? Well, I think uh, the administration's position in uh, budgetary matters is to cut back wherever you can. And I think what the Congress has done in resisting the administration in these matters is to declare and demonstrate its interest, and I think the interest of the majority of the American people, in the importance of the educational process. It's a hackneyed phrase, and it gets used often, but it's true that our young people are our most important uh, natural resource, and we need to develop them. 
But we've heard that said by both Republicans and Democrats. That's right. Time That's and right. time again. That's right. No, I, I think uh, that the administration's uh, interest has been budgetary to cut back and to, uh, if you will, turn more responsibility for lots of social services, particularly education, to the states. Uh, and I think the states, by and large, have done a, a good job of, of picking up the slack and making up for what the federal government hasn't been doing. But there are differences among states economically. And uh, I think that there's an important role for the federal government in helping to even out the differences in, in serving underserved youngsters. Uh, an important role in making up the differences among states, just as I think a state in itself has a responsibility to make up the differences in the funding of educational resources in the communities, because the communities in every state differ widely in what they can put into education. So I think it goes from the local community to the state to the federal government. What's happening is that the federal government's been trying to push it more back down to the states and the, and the local authorities. Speaking of financing, there's some criticism about getting forms for student financial aid. Uh, what, what is the general picture? Well, uh, this year we have a particular problem that's a result of the uh, congressional action in the, what's called the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. That's the act that provides financial aid to students. Because of the lateness of the passage of the law and then the time required uh, by the uh, Department of Education to issue regulations, uh, we're just about a month behind in getting forms out to the schools uh, for youngsters to use in applying for financial aid. And the message we want to get out this fall in particular is that uh, not to worry, there are funds available. Don't, uh, don't assume that because there aren't forms to apply for aid that there isn't aid. There will be aid. Uh, the forms will be there in December instead of now in, in February. And uh, we're, we're uh, doing all we can to get them out fast. Only thing we'd say is to students and parents, when you get them, get them in early so we can start processing them. Your talk here at Ball State University is uh, about the assessment of excellence, is that correct? In pursuit of excellence. In pursuit of what, excellence. What is the essence of that? Well, my, my point here is that there's been an educational reform movement going on in this country, I contend, since the middle 70s when people noticed that average scores nationally on our SAT were going down. A lot of people took this as evidence of the concern they had about the schools. So the reform movement started back in the late 70s, uh, and it's gathered momentum, focused originally in, through the early years of, of the 80s on the secondary school. What's happened now is the focus is on higher education. And my concern is that uh, legislators, state authorities, will try to treat colleges and, and universities in the same way they've treated school. And there's a great difference because Schools in this country are basically common and compulsory, and higher educational institutions are diverse and by choice. And by forcing institutions into a common mold through common assessment, it runs the danger of uh, destroying that diversity that's one of the great strengths of American education. So my, my message to, to public authorities is don't put too much pressure on it. My message to the institutions is you better get on the stick because I'm afraid if you don't do it yourselves, reflecting your diversities, somebody's going to do it for you. How would they do this uh, inflexibility, for example? Uh, is it a congressional matter, uh, a matter of... It's not a, it's not a matter of, of, of uh, federal responsibility. It's a matter of state responsibility. And uh, state uh, uh, requirements through assessment Students must achieve uh, a certain level uh, in all students in all institutions. And I just think in higher education that's wrong because different institutions have different purposes. Different programs within institutions have different purposes. Technical, engineering, scientific on the one hand, the humanities, uh, social sciences on the other. These all have different uh, ways of teaching, different ways of assessing people's progress, and to try to force them all into a common mold, I think would be uh, terrible. Isn't that attempted also through financial aid? 
Uh, not, the conformity? Not, not so extent. much. No. Yeah. Students, by and large, I think we've succeeded in giving students the choice. They, there aren't requirements that go with financial aid. Uh, the, uh, uh, it, could, it could be through other kinds of institutional support from state legislators. If you don't do it right, we'll withdraw your funding. But I think it'll be general funding, not student funding. I think, uh, I think the, the, the principle of giving students choice through financial aid is, uh, is going to stay. What are the one or two most important problems facing higher education today? Well, I think the, uh, the largest problem that one faces, if it looks at it simply in, in general, are the demographics, the number of students, the, the size of the cohorts from which college students come are getting smaller and will into the 1990s. So that I think that generally speaking, the problem is one of maintaining enrollments. And I think the way to do that with a declining age group is to increase the number of youngsters in those age groups who are college-bound and college-able. That's what our equality project, that virtually everything we're doing is designed to try and help in some way or other to increase the pool of college-able, college-bound youngsters in high school. I think that alone is the, is the problem that, uh, the single problem that needs most attention. The Muncie Symphony Orchestra, String Quintet, Joyce Keith, violin, John Weslowski, violin, Christine Treater, viola, Wallach Dubach, cello, and a special guest artist, Stanley Geidel, clarinet, perform Mozart's Clarinet Quintet Movement Number no. 1, Allegretto. <laughs>
Dr. Wayman Spence is a successful physician, prison doctor, hospital administrator, inventor, columnist, publisher, and businessman. He talks with us about wellness. He's a consultant to the Ball State Wellness Program. Dr. Spence, what will be your involvement with the Ball State Wellness Institute? <laughs> on, on the record or off the record? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll, I, uh, to advise, uh, strictly, and I'll do anything I can to help them, particularly probably my uh, uh, interest that relates to um, uh, health education of all the sins in life, and that's booze and smoking and being lazy and being fat. You've done quite a bit of work, uh, seminars, uh, articles, and books on against smoking, drugs, and, and, and drinking. That's true. Are we making any inroads on these problems? Making gajillions of inroads. Goodness gracious, yes. In 1964, when the Surgeon General's report came out, 60% of all physicians smoke. Today, only less than 10% smoke. The entering class at Harvard last year, only 12 in the whole class smoked. And if you could go right here to Ball State and check the number of kids, I'll bet it's about 15% will smoke on this campus. And if you went back into the 50s, it would have been 60%. Yet we don't see the sales of cigarettes declining that much. Are they selling overseas or well, for different yeah. markets? Well, for one thing, that, that's a little bit of a gimmick because they sell a lot lower tars, so you've got to smoke more of them, seriously. If you remember back when we were uh, young, <laughs> 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 uh, and you, how did you describe a heavy smoker? Pack a day, man. Pack a day is nothing now. They're all taking two and three and four packs a day. So they're smoking much more with the filters and the different, different uh, uh, content. So a little bit of that is a gimmick. But we have definitely reduced smoking considerably to where we're approximately 32% smoke now in the United States. That's been due to what? Oh, I think it's education. Absolutely. If we've done that with smoking, then we could do it with drinking and drugs. Have we made the same inroads, or are we beginning to make the same inroads? I think a lot of it is the glass half full and half empty syndrome. One of the things that we can be very proud of is that today, almost anybody who can read well in the United States is informed about smoking. They really are. And you're already finding today, practically everybody who is able to read and communicate can be informed about drinking and driving, as an example, where we didn't talk about it in the 50s. I think we've made a lot of progress but a tremendous amount to be done, of course. How about drugs? Well, we're doing very well with drugs, I think. You have to realize, see, you even, even that little gimmick that you said, how about drugs, when I just said alcohol, alcohol is the most important drug in America. <laughs> you can't separate drugs and alcohol. That's, that, that's a fallacy. But even there is an example of progress we're making because you're not arguing with me about that. Alcohol is the number one drug abuse problem in America. The government is telling you, the churches are telling you, the schools are telling you, and we're accepting that that in itself is progress. That is true. Uh, <coughs> is it more difficult to get off the drug of alcohol than it is to wean yourself away from cocaine or heroin, marijuana? <coughs> alcohol uh, uh, is one of the most dangerous drugs to come off, off of. The old DTs that we used to talk about are more dangerous than coming off heroin. Absolutely. It's very hard to get off of. That, but when you're talking about, like you're asking me in a way, like, is a tiger's bite worse than a lion's bite? <laughs> well, where does it bite you, first of all? <laughs> and how big was the tiger or lion? They're both bad. Is there anything that we are not doing that we should be doing? Oh, anything specifically? Yes. I can think of nothing specifically that we should be doing. We should be doing a better job and more of it, of course. As far as education is concerned, as as education. In, in these areas, uh -huh. uh, I mean, education is really what we have to offer in a de democratic society. I can, we can go to Taiwan as an example, which is a very structured society, and you're going to see essentially no drug abuse that you call drug abuse, because if you're caught, they hang you Monday morning. But that's not the society we live in. <laughs> so we're going to have to. <laughs> so that's not the approach. <laughs> educate people not to use drugs. It's education, yes. Uh -huh. What is the SRI concept? Uh, company that you have formed and tell us about it. Well, uh, SRI stands for Spence Research Institute and actually this is a little bit of a different thing. Spence Research Institute takes ideas from healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses and so on and links them up with companies who need viable economic ideas in the healthcare sector. So we're a bridge between entrepreneurial ideas and structured companies. 
Mm -hmm. And what, what's new in the medical field in that respect? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah, it's not new. <laughs> it's, all, it's also new. If we don't read USA Today, we don't know what's new. If we're out of date very quickly. Uh, that Tremendous amount new in, in everything monoclonal antibodies, anything you want to talk about. All right, today. let's talk about it. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> Just yeah. a few of the things. You're going to show how ignorant I am now. <laughs> <laughs> a few of the things that would be of interest that you think are very important. Well, since I just threw out this fancy term, monoclonal antibodies, uh, this relates to uh, some uh, uh, biogenetic ways that we're able to make diagnostic tests very quickly on blood and body parts. And as an example, you can find out if you're pregnant just like that. You don't have to go to the doctor anymore and wait for the rabbit to uh, have symptoms. Uh, you can uh, measure your own glucose if you're a diabetic at home better than your doctor could do it in the office three years ago. You can come in and go to the mall and have your, have your cholesterol checked, and it will be more accurate than the hospital was doing 10 months ago. So all of these studies are going to be available to the general population just like your weight is available to you. But it's not available at this point. Well, it's available Being, a great deal already, as an example. You, if you'll go to, we already have a, almost a billion dollar market in home diagnostic kits. So as, as another example, if you need to know whether you're having a little uh, problem in your colon, you can go to any drugstore in the United States, get a little kit, and see if there's blood in there. You couldn't have done that five years ago. Couldn't have done it three years ago. Check it yourself. Ooh, is that important? I mean, uh, only I, if you, you want to live. <laughs> well, I mean, shouldn't the doctor be doing some of these things rather than having the the person doing them at home? Well, no more than he should be weighing you every day, or or seeing that you go to the bathroom or brush your teeth. These are this is your responsibility. You sh you can monitor your body functions better than a physician can because it's your body. So you look in the mirror every day. That's the best way to know how you're doing. You don't need to have you go have your body fat measured underwater. Look in the mirror, and you can tell how your body fat's coming. You can look at your eyes. You can all common sense. And then if we have to get beyond common sense, we can do it a little with a little fancy test. And this is what we're talking about: home diagnostic kits, which we've sort of gotten off onto another kick here, are tremendously valid and important. And they're an example of people taking charge of part of their own healthcare system, uh, own healthcare. After one finds a problem, then you have to plug yourself into the system. You're not going to really take your own colon out, but you want to go and get it taken care of quickly. And it, this would not be an exaggeration to say that if uh, Ronald Reagan had been doing this religiously, he would not have had his, his cancer. Absolutely not. It would have been caught early. As far as tests are concerned and talking of testing your own mm -hmm. blood, uh, the case of AIDS, for instance, do you mm -hmm. ever foresee when people would be testing themselves for that? And would it be wise for them to do it? Uh, well, AIDS is, uh, the, AIDS is called syndrome, S-Y-N-D-O-M-E. Syndrome means a picture. It's a grouping of problems. And uh, that would not be uh, one that I would foresee you're diagnosing yourself with. No, it's a more complicated thing. And even if there were a simple diagnosis, you would run into all kinds of psychological complications, too. Well, no more than any other very serious d disease, I, I wouldn't think. No. Okay, let's talk about wellness. And okay. the reason you're here All at Paul right. State University to uh, help with our wellness awareness program. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really taken off. I, mm -hmm. I'm trying to interest uh, the university and community in wellness. Mm -hmm. And how do you motivate people? Well, you, we hope you motivate them with the truth. The truth will make you free. And you begin, to, you begin to discuss and dialogue and tell them things that are the truth. And people aren't stupid and they wake up. But that doesn't always work. For example, diabetics will, knowing they shouldn't, continue to eat sweets. People are given prescription medicine to take to alleviate a problem. They won't take that medicine. Why mm. do people act in this way, even though they know the truth? Well, uh, you, <laughs> again, you're not going to have all winners in life for anything. I can tell you how to do a layup in basketball since I happen to be in Indiana, and you'll still try to do it off the wrong foot. <laughs> but one has the opportunity now to do things right, and I think a vast majority will, of people will respond to enlightenment and try to do things right, and they are. But we still... We, Mankind and animals and many other creatures, of course, can be self-destructive. I won't deny that at all.